Gerald Schlosser tonight. Uh, those of you that don't know Gerald, he's written a book called Legacy of the Beast about Aleister Crowley. Uh, also, Hitler, the Occult Messiah, and the Central John D. Reader. And he's probably the most knowledgeable individual on Crowley that I know, and a very dear friend of mine for the last 10 years. Will you welcome him? Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. I'd like to say thank you, Laura, and how honored I am to be here and pleased to be here, too. I lived in Los Angeles from 1981 to 1982, and uh, it's a real pleasure to be back again. Now, I do hope that uh, what I've got to say will interest you. Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. It is my will to explain what Alistair Crowley had to say to you, and it is obviously your will to be here to listen to it, otherwise why did you pay $15? Now, I think it was uh, Oscar Wilde who said that the English and the Americans have absolutely everything in common, except their language. I sincerely hope there won't be any linguistic difficulties here tonight. I remember some time ago, uh, I was with a very good bunch of guys uh, in some bar somewhere, and they wanted me to come to a party. And they wanted me to come now. And I said, sure. Uh, just give me a couple of minutes to score some fags to bring with me. I walked away and got my packet of cigarettes, came back, and I couldn't understand why they were giving me the cold shoulder. And uh, he, he, a friend of yours, and I said, yeah, what's the matter, guys? I mean, uh, you're bringing these two. And they got even more offended and more <laughs> insulted. It, it took five minutes of, you know, that sort of very boring conversation between the English and the Americans. Oh, what we say. Uh, when we say this means, oh, and what we say is this. But finally, you know, we got it sorted out, and thank heavens for that. But I sincerely hope that no such difficulties will lead to uh, what I call Manglo-American relations. <laughs> now, it's very difficult to uh, address an audience on Crowley because you don't actually know just how much the audience knows on him. You don't know at what point you come in on the matter. What I do not propose to do is to give one of those lectures which I've attended far too often. And after one hour, you know, you sort of look at your watch and it seems like three hours have gone by. And you realize, oh my God, we're only in 1922 and uh, he died in 1947. Mm -hmm. uh, I propose to summarize his life very briefly because what I really want to talk about are his ideas and uh, how they affect us today. I would ask the indulgence of anybody in the audience who has really put in a lot of, uh, not only study, but also practice of these matters. I really don't want to be in the position of the charming Californian waitress uh, one time when I was in a coffee shop and I saw soup du jour on the menu. And uh, I wondered what it was, called over the waitress and said, uh, what's the soup du jour, please? And she gave me one of those lovely Californian smiles and said, why, sir, that's the soup of the day. I know that. <laughs> and I don't really want to give you a soup du jour tonight. So, first of all, who was Alistair Crowley? He was born in 1875 and he died in 1947. He was brought up in the Plymouth Brethren, an exclusive and utterly disgusting Christian sect, which believes in taking every single word of the Bible literally. Unsurprisingly, he rebelled against it. He went into a stage which uh, some might call depression, uh, some might call an existential crisis, but it's the sort of thing that hits many people when they're in their teenage years. And it's a, a most deplorable feeling of utter futility, that absolutely nothing in life is worthwhile. And it's very strange to get it, actually, when you're a teenager, uh, because that's when the animal spirits should be at their utmost. But that's paradoxically enough, when many people get it. He gave up his ambitions to become an ambassador. He gave up his ambitions to become world chess champion. He had high hopes of realizing that ambition. He uh, was regarded as coming master, had beaten the future champion of Scotland, and even in later life, when he only played chess for recreation, he would beat uh, European grandmasters. But he gave that up because one thing and one thing only mattered to him. Uh, many years ago, um, I interviewed uh, an American conservative uh, called William F. Buckley, and I asked him what, in his opinion, 
was the point of life. He replied by um, his usual um, rather long-winded blathering on about uh, uh, Roman Catholicism, which is the worst aspect of that otherwise, in my opinion, exceptionally intelligent man. But then he said, if I did not believe in that, and he was good, if I did not believe in that, I would be very much inclined towards Camus' point that the only serious philosophical question is whether or not to commit suicide. And actually, uh, I think uh, Buckley got it on the ball there, and the only serious philosophical question is whether or not to commit suicide. Uh, because if life is just a matter of getting born, getting married, and pissing off, well, frankly, what are we doing here? Surely there is some kind of essential meaning to life. Now, this is what Crowley thought, and he thought that that way, which we'll be going into later on in this talk, uh, was a way called magic. And he joined the Order of the Golden Dawn, and he made remarkable progress. And then there were a series of quarrels which do not concern us, because the favorite occupation of uh, occultists seems to be quarreling with one another rather than getting on with some work. Uh, and uh, if only people worked rather than quarreled, just think what we could accomplish. However, he was involved in that quarrel. He departed from the Golden Dawn, and he proceeded to go around the world twice, learning in every country from everyone he met. Uh, he was the sort of man who, he never let a day pass without learning something new. He lived life to the full. You name it, he did it. He was, for example, probably the greatest mountaineer of his generation. Only the other day I was reading a book on mountaineering uh, by some guy who'd uh, climbed Everest. And he was talking about the Crowley-Eckenstein expedition to K2, or Chogori, as it is often called. And this is the second highest mountain in the world. They made the first attempt upon it. They made it without oxygen. They set a record that was not uh, surpassed for 25 more years. And there was a quarrel. I'd never known this before. I wish I'd put it in my book, between uh, Eckenstein, the leader of the expedition, and Crowley, the deputy leader. And Eckenstein was saying, we climb it that way. And Crowley was saying, we climb it that way. And they'd made a written agreement that in the event of dispute, uh, Eckenstein's decision as leader was final. And so they did it Eckenstein's way. And although they set records, um, they didn't climb it. Oddly enough, K2, or Che Ri, was climbed in the 1950s. And it was climbed by Crowley's route. And the uh, author on mountaineering in his book remarked, if they'd only attempted it that way, who knows, they might have made it, and we'd now be talking about Crowley Ridge. He was, moreover, a very good poet, a very fine poet. He published volumes and volumes of poetry, not all of it excellent. Uh, I thought I'd give you uh, just a few examples uh, of his poetry, uh, nothing too heavy, just sort of short snippets. Um, in a very light mood, he uh, could throw off lines like, the world for a whore, the sky for a harlot, all life at your door for a woman of scarlet. I'll give that and more in this planet of boredom for a girl that's a whore and is proud of her whoredom. Or he could get very uh, intellectual, as in the metaphysics of these verses is perfectly absurd. My curses, no sooner in an iron word I formulate my thought and yet perceive the same to be absurd. Or it could be quite moving. I didn't have time to uh, memorize this. Um, this is when his marriage broke up. Uh, he was married to a very, very beautiful woman. He married her to get her out of a jam. More of that anon. Um, OK. Cry like a dog and run about the city. He's lamenting, uh, you know, this breakup of a marriage with a woman he totally loved. There is no word left. Now the deed is dead. No thought of her is in me. I'm a stranger to all that dream of danger and bliss that rose was, the green shoots of life that spring in me are fed, not even on the mire of her decay. They spring from other roots. Now I'm cleansed of her. I am, so to say, a man part paralyzed. One limb is dead, in feeling as in emotion. This remains to us. We'll all catch death. How soon this head excites its miserable brains. To think the world it knows by intellect. 
to be the right word, pity, then reflect, pitiful, pitiful, most pitiful, the pity of it, think of the love, the love past, blossoms too beautiful, think of the hardships conquered comrade-wise, think of the babe in its most piteous end, all these things sound like lies, I do not comprehend anything of them, pity, 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 tis like the dripping of some stagnant rain, from the housetops of a ruined city upon the flagstones, not one petal clings upon the stalk or of life or memory stain, not one pale thought with blushes, my soul's dead, as a corpse flung out of the tideway on the stinking flats of London mud. The springs are dry beyond appeal, dull grey like lead, and heavier is my soul's carrion. If she came pleading now, pure, passionate and sane, I would not take her back again. I'm warned, that's one word. Let my own back feel the lash. All power of love is burnt right through to ash. Bread in a mortar, mix with gall and ink, and give it to the children. Quite powerful poetry, I hope you uh, will agree. And he wrote poetry throughout his life. He dedicated his life to magic. As a result of this, and as a result of the fact that he was very unconventional, and very intelligent, and very tough, and didn't scare easy, and loved women very, very much, this made him dreadfully unpopular. And um, I think the greatest uh, instinct of mediocrity is the passion to persecute. And this is what happened to him. Now, I'm going to give you some of the things that they said about him. Because many people, when uh, you mention Alistair Crowley, freak out. Uh, they've read some wretched <laughs> book by a vulgar journalist uh, called Simons, and they actually believe it. <laughs> The myths about Crowley are, well, judge for yourself. I thought to, I apologize for reading from the book, but I put it down there because it's the most concise way in which I can convey it to you. And uh, let's open with a quote from Jonathan Swift. When a man of genius appears, you may know him by this sign, that all the dunces are united in a confederacy against him. In 1907, Florence Farr Emery wrote the following in the New Age, a London periodical of that time. It is a hydra-headed monster, this London opinion, but we should not be surprised at all to see an almost unparalleled event, namely, every one of those hydra-heads moving with a single purpose, and that purpose, the denunciation of Mr. Alistair Crowley and all his works. Now, this would be a remarkable achievement for a young gentleman who only left Cambridge quite a few years ago. It requires a certain amount of serious purpose to stir public opinion into active opposition. And the only question is, has Mr. Crowley a serious purpose? A final judgment is that the young man is a remarkable product of an unremarkable age. His power of expression is extraordinary. His kite flies, but he never fails to jerk it back to earth with some touch of ridicule or bathos, which makes it still an open question whether he will excite that life-giving animosity on the part of public opinion, which is accorded only to the most dangerous thinkers. This life-giving animosity can best, I think, be uh, demonstrated via a series of quotations. John Bull magazine, 5 November 1910, Mr. Alistair Crowley's blasphemous and prurient propaganda. Sunday Express, 26 November, 1922. Whenever he needs money and cannot get it from fresh victims, he sends them on the streets of Palermo or Naples to earn it for him. He served once a prison sentence in America for procuring young girls for a similar purpose. <laughs> Why didn't he sue? Quite simple, he didn't have money. Ah, here's a nice one, Sunday Express, 26 November, 1922. A large number of his books are printed privately, some of them in Paris. <laughs> They're either incomprehensible or disgusting. 
generally both. His language is the language of a pervert, and his ideas are negligible. Headlines from John Bull included the king of depravity, the wickedest man in the world, king of depravity arrives, we trap the temptress, oh, that must have been a luscious one, a cannibal at large, a man we'd like to hang, and a human beast returns. Can human folly and fatuity go further? Yes, it can, and it did every week in the Sunday Express and John Bull. Now, there's... No point in pretending that Alistair Crowley was a saint. It's quite impossible to give that man a coat of whitewash, thank goddess. That man certainly had his faults, and these included, included vanity, uh, conceit, uh, a certain habit of not paying bills. He lived out uh, Oscar Wilde's maxim, uh, the only way to live in the memory of England's commercial classes is by not paying one's bills. <laughs> Um, he often accused people of stealing from him on the basis of very slender evidence, or no evidence at all. He was vicious if attacked, very vicious indeed, and his treatment of two disciples of his, Norman Mudd and Leo Herzig, is very hard to understand and very hard to uh, excuse. So he was no saint, but then nor were any of the great religious teachers of mankind. And uh, anybody who does that statement would be well advised to uh, study uh, the lives written by the enemies of the great teachers of mankind. <laughs> now, um, in, in point of fact, um, I think it's probable that his virtues made him many more enemies, actually, than his vices. Israel Rigardi, uh, a late dear friend of mine, argued in The Eye in the Triangle that um, Crowley, in uh, an experience in the Sahara when he invoked uh, the great demon of dispersion, Haranzon, actually uh, failed to overcome his repressed father hatred and his Oedipus complex, and that his crossing into mastership, though done, was flawed. Myself, I don't agree, but uh, I'd recommend all of you to uh, study Rigardi's skillfully argued case and draw your own conclusions. It's certainly worth study for anyone who's interested in annihilating the ego. I think Crowley uh, did actually annihilate his ego. After he did that, he played with it and he bounced it like a ball. Um, one thing I really don't like about him is that he was frequently slagging off gays and frequently uh, slagging off uh, sadists and masochists when he himself was bisexual with sadomasochistic tendencies on any swung both ways. Um, this, I think, is probably the worst thing that can be said about him. Normally, anyone who's heard of Alistair Crowley says, um, oh my God, uh, you know, that terrible man, uh, that Satanist. He wasn't a Satanist at all. He aspired to union with all that is holy in the universe. And we will be getting on to that. But uh, he's often uh, slagged off for liking sex and drugs. So do, so many, and so what? <laughs> Uh, in any case, Crowley's use of sex and drugs uh, would sound positively tame compared to the use by the average uh, rock star or Hollywood starlet. Uh, all one can say really is, big deal, he liked those things, so what? But I think probably his virtues made him even more enemies than his vices. He was a brilliant man, of very many talents, some would say a genius, and distinguished by physical and moral courage one night in uh, India, he was attacked by uh, seven uh, guys armed with knives. Um, he just pulled out his revolver and killed two of them. Um, that was why he went to China. Um, um, he had, a, I think, the most wonderful sense of humor, um, a greater sense of humor than perhaps any teachers who, who have become, uh, who've come uh, before him. Um, for example, one uh, joke of his I particularly like, I don't know about you, but personally, I can't bear interfering busybodies who uh, kill other people's joy. Nor could he. And there he was sitting, uh, he had this house by Loch Ness, uh, Boleskine House, and he noticed that there was a local society for the suppression of vice. So he wrote them a letter which said, um, Dear Sir, I find that prostitution in the neighborhood 
is most unpleasantly conspicuous. Please do something to abate this nuisance, which day by day, to me, grows more intolerable. I'd willingly spend a considerable sum signed at the Lord of Belesco. So the Society for the Suppression of Vice sent in an investigation team, and they poked around everywhere. But I mean, they were way out in the sticks. I mean, it's Loch Ness, there's sort of one village, and maybe with a bit of luck you can get a glass of whiskey uh, at about six o'clock in the evening. I mean, it's that dead there. But they spent a lot of money, and they uh, regretfully <coughs> wrote back after six months to the Lord uh, Beleskin saying that they'd made a thorough investigation, they'd spent a lot of money, and they did not find prostitution in the neighbourhood to be most unpleasantly conspicuous, whereupon Crowley sent them a postcard saying simply, conspicuous by its absence, you fools. <laughs> So I mean, what we've got so far is a very uh, entertaining character who's really lived a full-blooded life as a man. But what we've got to explore is what did this uh, man actually contribute to the two matters which I think are at the absolute heart of magic, occultism, yoga, um, the whole umbrella, whatever path you're into. What are the two essential things? your and my individual enhancement of your own consciousness. That is priority number one. And the general evolution of humanity. Those are the two primary reasons for taking up the great work. So it's not called the great work for nothing. Now, what is it that Alistair Crowley had to contribute to the great work? Now, the first thing, obviously, uh, we've got to consider is his con contribution to magic. Now, on this, um, is it possible to have sort of hands up anybody who's done any ritual or ceremonial magic? Is there anybody who's done any? Great. Um, hands up who uh, hasn't done any? Right. Okay. Um, will the majority forgive me if uh, just a quick uh, explanation? Um, I would define magic as the science and art of realizing the divine self by changing the human self. It's a set of techniques for doing that. Alistair Crowley himself called it the science and art of causing change to occur in conformity with will. So what it is, is a set of techniques. We are all biological computers. We have had programming inserted into us. Magic, the yoga of the West, if you like, is a way of achieving states of consciousness whereby we can reprogram ourselves and therefore lead a freer and more ful fulfilling life. That is the point of it. We can experience states of consciousness which enable us as human beings to know and do our will, our real purpose in life, in the vast and starry universe that we inhabit. Okay, <coughs> what do these techniques consist of? And the reason I called magic the yoga of the West is magic and yoga, we are talking about extroversion and introversion. The essence of both methods is one-pointed concentration. If you are using the Eastern methods, what you are essentially doing, the essence of that method, is to cut out everything except the one thought. It's a total turning inward. Magic uses the tendency of the Western mind to turn outward in order to accomplish the same objective. So, the wand, cup, the sword, the disc, the gestures of the magician, the lineal geometrical figures that the magician traces, the incense, the decorations of the temple, all these things are like a bombardment of sensory data which the magician is turning out to in order to bring about this one-pointed concentration upon a single objective. And if it really works, magic and yoga are the same here, the ego closes down and the power comes right through the unconscious. Now, what about the things that magicians see and experience? Are these things objective 
or subjective. You know, I don't think it matters which position you adopt. Uh, I think as one uh, advances along the path, one's comprehension of the universe alters accordingly, and it's like a sort of zigzag, objective, subjective, objective, subjective. Um, the question before us is, are there gods and goddesses out there, and angels and archangels and elementals, or is everything that takes place simply what we've got in our head here? For practical purposes, it makes no difference whatsoever. Myself, I find it helpful in practice to use the objective theory because there's something a little bit unmagical about uh, starting a, a, an invocation saying, well, what am I going to do today? Yes, I shall hallucinate a, a complex in my own mind. Um, it does not quite give you that sort of starting power which uh, one would like. Now, what the magician does is train his will or her will an imagination, so that you can use external stimuli to set up a specific change in consciousness to activate, in other words, those the eight-ninths of the brain that we do not normally use, or, in uh, so-called low magic, to accomplish a precise practical objective. Again, the essence of the matter is the will and the imagination. And you use external stimuli to inflame the, the imagination and excite the will so the will punches through the imagination in order to get the desired change required. What is the ultimate objective of magic? The most important goal is what's called the knowledge and conversation of the Holy Guardian Angel. What is the Holy Guardian Angel? You could say it is a being far greater than you are that is there to ensure when you appeal to it that you can do your will, that wishes you infinite love. Or you could say it's the purest, noblest, most beautiful and most truthful part of yourself. Crowley adopted a variety of positions, although at the end of his life in Magic Without Tears, he said it's definitely an independent entity. But I don't think uh, it's compulsory to follow his example. I don't think it matters. Whatever it is, one is going towards the most beautiful, the most true, the most pure, and the most noble. So who cares, really, whether it's out there or in there, as long as it's achieved. Take whichever theory suits you for your objective. Where did Crowley get his teaching from? He got it from the Order of the Golden Dawn. I do not propose to go into the history of the Order of the Golden Dawn. I'm, I'm sure everybody's heard it 10,000 times, and there's so many books on it. But the essence of Golden Dawn magic is to use a set of ceremonial techniques so as to bring the person who comes into it to the light. The idea of coming to the light is at the, it is the essence of Golden Dawn. Now Crowley later on proceeded with his Golden Dawn knowledge to expand from there. He wanted to streamline the Golden Dawn techniques as much as he could. And so, one masterpiece, for instance, is a book called Lieber Nort. This book, Lieber Nort, will give you general, sensible guidance and advice. The ritual of the pentagram, the ritual of the hexagram, the assumption of God forms, astral vision, and a practice called rising on the plains. And it does this in about seven pages. Uh, a great many books on uh, magic are very little more than an expansion on those seven pages. He also put together a ritual for the invocation of the Holy Guardian Angel, Libasamek. Now, I don't want to talk too much about graves, because one of the uh, most tiresome things in the occult is the habit people have of playing a very tedious game 
called, when it's not called holier than, uh, than thou, it's often called uh, my wand is bigger than yours. <laughs> that stuff should have been left behind in the school playground. And wouldn't it be nice if people grew up and didn't do it? Um, and I don't propose also to um, discuss what grade did Crayley reach. Um, I think the best thing I ever heard said about grades was by uh, good old Israel Regardi. And uh, whenever he was asked his grade, he'd say simply, I'm a student. We're all students. And that, of course, is the basic truth of the matter. Now, I happen to believe, you don't need to agree with me, that in the Sahara, in 1909, Crowley did annihilate his ego and cross the abyss. Really, if we're talking about grades, we're talking, we can simplify it into four stages. The first stage is that of student, who simply studies the system. The second stage is that of initiate, who practices the system and has received initiation either through the self or through joining of a, a good order. The third stage is that of adept, who really knows how to use those energies and can link up with the holy guardian angel. And the fourth stage is that of master, who has annihilated the ego and is charged with the duty of tending the garden of disciples and with conserving uh, his or her understanding of what uh, the universe is about and its most sacred truths. Now, Crowley proceeded to write instructions as to how to cross the abyss, as it's called, how to annihilate the ego. His magical instructions are probably the clearest ever written. They are so succinct, they are so to the point, you have to be an absolute bloody fool to go wrong with them. It's just one, two, three, four. Do this, 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 this. There is absolutely no padding whatsoever. Because I think one of the things about Crowley that's insufficiently understood is the fact that he made great use of scepticism. And I'd just like to give you a few examples of his scepticism. from Lieber Nort. In this book, it is spoken of the Sephiroth and the paths of spirits and conjurations, of gods, spheres, planes, and many other things which may or may not exist. It is immaterial whether they exist or not. By doing certain things, certain results follow. Students are most earnestly warned against attributing objective reality or philosophic validity to any of them. The advantages to be gained from them are chiefly these. A widening of the horizon of the mind, B, an improvement of the control of the mind. That is all he's saying in that introduction there. Uh, another uh, example of the scepticism is one moment. Oh, scepticism is a question mark. Um, has anybody here read The Soldier and the Hunchback? If scepticism is a question mark, here's an exclamation mark. Had I a million songs, and every song a million words, and every word a million meanings, I could not count the choral throngs of beauty's beatific birds, or gather up the paltry gleanings of this great harvest of delight. Hast thou not heard the words aright? The world is truly infinite. Crowley believed that anybody who was undertaking any step upon the path should keep a record and keep that record meticulously. He also urged everybody who studied under him to exercise the utmost scepticism over every single event which happened to them and always give it the natural explanation rather than the supernatural or fantasy explanation. Now, a very curious question is, why did this extremely skeptical man who advocated uh, the end of religion, yes, but the methods of science, a man who had been scientifically trained, a, a, a man who had been to Cambridge University, why did this man embrace something called the Book of the Law. 
It's a curious question because he fought against it for so very long. Now, the whole matter is rather strange in that there was Alistair Crowley on honeymoon. Why was he on honeymoon? Well, originally it had been to get a poor girl out of a jam. Um, he was uh, playing golf with his friend Gerald Kelly, later Sir Gerald and president of the Royal Academy, and uh, he noticed that Gerald had a sister around, and she was seen photographs of her, uh, very, very beautiful. And they'd never had much uh, communication with each other, and suddenly, Rose wanted to talk to him. That was her name, Rose Kelly. And the situation was this, that there were two, her parents kept on nagging her to get married. She was, in fact, carrying on an affair with a married man called Frank Summers down in London, unknown to her parents. But they were trying to force on her these two impossibly dull husbands. She had uh, tried to put them off by saying, you haven't got enough money. Go away and make some money, and then I'll marry you. And unfortunately, they'd gone away, made loads of money, and come back to marry her. <laughs> On top of that, she was broke, and she was living off her parents, and she couldn't stand her parents, and she just didn't know what to do. And what Crowley said was, well, I've got the uh, absolute solution. Quite simple, marry me. Well, what do you mean, she must have said. Are you crazy? And he said, it's quite simple. You marry me, that makes you responsible to me for your conduct and not to your parents. As far as I'm concerned, you can do what the hell you like. Um, in fact, I suggest you go to London and carry on as Frank Summer's mistress. I've got a mistress coming at uh, my place uh, in a couple of days. So let's just go off and get married. And uh, she said, y you're not uh, in love with me or something? No, not at all. Oh, why not? Um, anyway. <laughs> anyway. Uh, they they uh, dashed off and uh, got married, and, and Rose was so amazed by his chivalrous conduct that she fell in love with him. And the next thing he knew, he was being hijacked to a hotel because she said, if we're going to do this, we're going to do this properly. And suddenly, he found himself madly in love with her. And he described uh, his marriage as one long uninterrupted sexual debauch, and may every marriage be like that. <laughs> now, they went out east, um, they, he said he wanted to adorn uh, their love by setting it in a thousand suave and sparkling settings. And uh, he took her to Paris, to Naples, to uh, Cairo, he took her to uh, India, they went big game hunting, he made drama and adventure for her. And then uh, she informed him that she was pregnant. And he was delighted. And they stopped over in Cairo on the way back. Now, the point about Rose was that she was an empty-headed woman of society who had absolutely no interest in the occult at all. And one, one day, this, she was apparently very lovely but very frivolous asked uh, Crowley to invo invoke the sylphs. The sylphs are the spirits of the air. And she did it rather in the same sort of manner that a woman might say to her husband, uh, isn't it about time you took me to the opera? And uh, so he thought, well, I'll give her a show. And actually, um, it was a, dis a disastrous failure, and he was very fed up. And he was fed up with himself and fed up with her. You know, sometimes in magic you say, be you ready to come when you are called, which always seems rather pointless if uh, they haven't come. And that was what happened on that occasion. Whereupon, Rose, to his amazement, said, uh, they're waiting for you. Well, what do you mean, who's waiting for me? They're waiting for you. And he kept on asking her, and she kept on going into dizzy spells. They are waiting for you. And finally, he managed to get out of her that uh, they meant, in fact, the god Horus, the uh, Egyptian god of war, and that Crowley had in some way offended him. And Crowley was most puzzled by this and had no respect at all for uh, his wife's uh, magical opinions. And he submitted her to a series of tests based on the correspondences of the Golden Dawn, um, where it's held that everything is connected with everything else uh, under a schema of 32 
categorizations. And she submitted to these tests and guessed correctly every time against total odds of roughly 22 million to one. This rather threw him. Then he said, look, you don't even know what Horace looks like. So she said, I'll show him to you at the museum. So they tramped down to the Bulat Museum, as it was then. It's the Cairo Museum now. And he burst out laughing, because she was wandering around with... Uh, there was Horace here and Horace there and Horace there. I mean, there were about a thousand images of Horace. And she kept running around saying, no, not that, not that, not that, not that, not that. And he's just leaning there, yawning. And then she said, there. And he froze. Because the number of the exhibit was 666, the Beast of Revelations. And it was also what his own mother kept calling him as a child. And the Beast and 666 had a special personal significance to him. This persuaded him to take uh, Rose's, uh, up till now, regarded as ravings, seriously. <coughs> and she told him to do a, uh, an invocation of the god Horus. Her invocation broke every single classical rule of magic. Nevertheless, he did it. And a great voice said, the equinox of the gods has come. And he didn't know what to do after that, and Rose just told him to uh, walk into this room between midday and noon on April 8, 9, and 10. Sit there with the pad and with a pen. So he did that, not knowing what the hell would happen. And uh, midday precisely, on each day, uh, a being who announced himself as I was turned up and proceeded to dictate the three chapters of the Book of the Law. He took it down, he looked round a few times, it was behind his left shoulder, and uh, he described uh, I was as, uh, well, let's see what his description was. Um, as he uh, thought at the time, yes, here we are. A being who announced himself as I was, according to the scribe, Iwas seemed to be a tall, dark man in his thirties, well-knit, active, and strong, with the face of a savage king, and eyes veiled, lest their gaze should destroy what they saw. The dress was not Arab. It suggested Assyria or Persia, but very vaguely. I took little note of it, for to me at that time, Iwas was an angel, such as I'd often seen in visions, a being purely astral. Crowley did not, in fact, like the Book of the Law. For a start, it proclaimed him a prophet. He had always regarded belief in oneself as a prophet as being evidence of delusion and insanity. He lost the manuscript. He fought against it for five years. In fact, he only discovered it because he was looking not for the manuscript of the Book of the Law, uh, but for a pair of skis. <laughs> now, what I want to do in the second half of this talk, because I think it's time we all had a break, is to go into what the Book of the Law meant to him and to go into yoga and Taoism and the three schools of magic, Crowley's contribution and Thalema and humanity. Thank you. <laughs>